Hello, and welcome to my presentation, Real-Time Machine Learning on the Edge with Pulsar Functions. My name is David Karamgard, and I'm a developer advocate at Stream Native. I'm also the author of Manning, Manning Press's Pulsar in Action and a, committee, a committer on the Apache Pulsar project. I want to start by examining edge computing environments, including their characteristics, uh, by looking at traditional edge topology inside of an industrial IIoT environment. I want to talk about some of the challenges these edge computing environments have in terms of providing analytics, and finally explore some of the opportunities there are for improving these capabilities using Apache Pulsar. Now, when I'm, we're talking about edge computing, we are referring to any computation that is happening outside of the traditional data center and or cloud environments. Edge computing is focused primarily on the processing of data closer to its source in order to decrease the decision latency for applications that require sub-second decisions, such as real-time fraud detection or preventative maintenance. This increase in response time is achieved by eliminating the need to first funnel the data up to the cloud before analyzing it. Now, a traditional IoT architecture, like the one shown here, is designed primarily to collect large amounts of data and funnel up to the cloud as fast as possible. There are a variety of components inside this topology, starting with the sensors and actuators that are attached to pieces of industrial equipment throughout the, throughout the environment. There are often multiple sensors per machine, so these devices make up the majority of the topology in terms of raw numbers. These sensors are designed to sense the physical conditions of the environment in real time and transmit their readings over short range protocols that are generally limited in range to 50 feet or less. Consequently, sensor hubs are strategically deployed throughout the environment to capture these short range, mess short range messages and rebroadcast them over a longer range protocol such as MQTT. Further up the topology are the IoT gateway devices which are mounted throughout the environment and connected to a power supply and traditional TCP IP connection. These devices capture the MQTT messages and retransmit them over TCP IP to either the edge or cloud for longer term storage and processing. Beyond the IoT gateways are the more traditional computing platforms with larger computational resources. At the edge, there's the optional devices that are often are the size of your traditional desktop or server machines that have been deployed on site and are where traditional edge computing takes place. As you can see, there's an inverse relationship between the computational resources available uh, relative to the proximity of, its, of it to the data. However, the goal of edge computing is to push the co computation as close to the source of data as possible to eliminate these additional network hops and the latency incurred at each step along the way.
We're trying to prevent catastrophic failure of an oil rig in order to prevent an, an environmental disaster and or loss of life. Therefore, we want to monitor readings from the numerous sensors embedded inside this platform and predict the probability of such a failure before it occurs. Now, from a data acquisition standpoint, the data available is simply the sensor readings on the platform itself. As we saw in the previous slide, there are numerous devices embedded throughout an oil rig, and all of these temperature, vibration, torque, and pressure readings are transmitted to an IoT gateway over MQTT to a Pulsar broker. Inside the Pulsar broker, a thread pool has already been enabled and initialized for executing uh, the machine learning model itself. So this is the environment that we have. This is the data available to the data scientists. Next, they take this information and the data science team is responsible for the development of the model itself and can use a variety of model types and toolkits. It's up to them to use their intuition and expertise in order to select the right tools for the job. But the key outputs of this activity are the model itself, in this case, a linear regression model, and a list of input values required for the model itself, also known as the feature vector as shown here. So again, in our case, these features will be the various sensor readings gathered from the drilling platform, things like the vibration sensors, temperature readings, various uh, torque readings, etc., will be fed to the model as inputs, and they generate an output of estimated hours before failure. This is a prediction, an indication of when a machine is going to fail. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the data science team will choose from a variety of languages, toolkits, and model types based on their expertise. We, as model deployers, do not want to impose any limitation on the data science team in this regard, and therefore need to be able to, to accommodate the widest variety of these models and languages and toolkits as possible. With Pulsar Functions, we can execute any model that has a corresponding runtime library for any of the programming languages currently supported, including Java, Python, or Go. So as you can see from this list, we can support nearly all of the languages with toolkits shown here and all the various model types as well. Once the model type and features have been identified, the hard part begins, the model training. This is again, the most time intensive part of the entire model development process. And as the data science team attempts to refine the relative weighting each feature in the feature vector has on the accuracy of the prediction. Once each feature has been assigned an associated weight, the trained model can then be exported and deployed to production. As model deployers, we will only be given a fully trained model for deployment, and we will be dealing with those inside of our Pulsar functions. Now the entire model training phase, again, is an iterative process that uses historical data to test the accuracy of the model with a given set of feature weights. This process is repeated until the model is considered accurate enough for deployment. As you can see in the figure here, a subset of historical data is, is, is taken out and called the training data set. Typically, this would be prior to a, an actual failure having occurred in real life. If we then run that data set through the trained model as we see fit with the weightings and in order to create those predictions. And those predictions are then compared against the actual results. If the accuracy, if it doesn't accurately predict a failure, uh, a failure event, for example, then the feature weights are adjusted and the model is retried and so on and so on until the correct weighting is, is achieved. Finally, after this entire process is done, comes the interesting part, the model deployment. The final stage of this process, the output of the model training phase is again, the fully trained model complete with a feature vector and its associated weights. Now this model dictates two things as shown here, all the different puzzle pieces shown. The first is the execution environment needed to run the model. For example, if this is a TensorFlow model, then we need to have a TensorFlow runtime library associated in order to execute the model. Secondly, associated with the, with the machine learning model and its type, its execution engine, is the feature vector definition, which in turn dictates what data we need to provide to the model itself. Thus, we need a way to have to access all this data at runtime. 
either in directly on the edge, either coming through an MQTT um, topic, or being able to read it from a third-party data repository and accessing it in real time. So why are Pulsar functions a good fit for this particular use case? I'll lay the case out here. The first and foremost is that the, Pulsar, the fully trained models can be provided to Pulsar functions via Pulsar's internal state store mechanism. So we can access it dynamically at runtime. We can even swap out trained models with newer versions with zero code changes or downtime. Now, since Pulsar functions allows the inclusion of any third party library, we can use any number of machine learning runtime environments based on the programming language of choice. Again, this allows us to support the widest variety of programming languages, toolkits, and model types based on our particular use case. As shown here, Deep Learning for J, TensorFlow, Pandas, Panda-based Python libraries, etc., can all be supported by Pulsar functions. Also, the ability to use these third-party libraries inside Pulsar functions also enables us to leverage existing client libraries to access any featured data that might not be residing in a traditional or may be residing in a traditional data repository, such as a database, uh, in-memory cache, or in-memory data grid at runtime. So again, if the data is not all provided by the topics, we can leverage these third-party libraries internally to query this information and gather, gather quickly from inside a Pulsar function. So let's put all of this together and walk through an example of how we would use Pulsar functions to deploy a fully trained model on the edge. Step number one is getting the model to the Pulsar function running on the edge. Now, when the data science team has completed its task and deems a model ready for production, they can push the model to the Pulsar state store using a simple REST command as shown here. The Pulsar state store is, stores the data in the storage layer of the Pulsar cluster, which in our case will be in the cloud environment. However, as we know, the IoT gateway can access this layer over its TCP IP connection. This model is then used to initialize the execution engine for the model uh, inside the thread running the Pulsar function on the IoT gateway itself. Now the feature collection process is triggered whenever a new message arrives. For example, a new sensor reading comes in over MQTT to one of the topics that the function is listening to. An optional data collection pipeline can occur if you need to gather additional features from external data sources. In our particular use case, we will not be needing this additional step, but it's the best practice to run this step independently so that, the, so that the data can be accessed in parallel in order to speed up that process. So for example, if you need to gather data, additional data from a cache and a database, executing both those queries in, in parallel allows you to shorten the length of that time to fulfill all the data needed for your feature vector and feed it to the execution engine. In our particular case, the model was exported in an ML-centric XML format known as PMML. However, the model can also be exported, exported in, into any binary format since the state store treats all data as raw bytes. Therefore, you should use the appropriate export format based on the machine learning library you are using. In our case, we'll be using the JPMML library, which expects PML data format. Therefore, that is what we will use. Again, these models can be pushed automatically by a REST call and the re release is controlled by the data science team. This slide shows the PMML of our machine learning model. As you can see, it specifies the machine learning model type as a linear regression model. And the feature vector, vector is captured in the data, dic data dictionary section and includes four different sensor readings as shown here. A two temperature readings, a torque reading, and a vibration reading. The output fields of the model are listed as numerical predictors there at the bottom. In this case, we have two, mean time to failure and remaining service hours. The command to publish the PMML model to the state store is shown here. We need to push it to the same tenant and namespace that the function will be running under in order to have access to the data at runtime. Here we provide the pre a predefined key that the Pulsar function will use to retrieve the model, along with the raw bytes of the PML file as, as the value as shown here. This is all that's required to publish these contents to the state store so they can be accessed by the Pulsar function at runtime. 
Now let's look at the code of the preventive maintenance Pulsar function itself. We will use Pulsar's RegEx subscription feature to listen to all the sensor topics, so we are fed all the data directly as it comes in. This way, when any new reading comes in, the process method shown here will be executed. The logic for this method is broken down into three different phases. The first is an initialization phase, which is executed only once and is used to retrieve the model from the state store, along with some user-specified configuration data. Secondly, a method that records each sensor reading inside an internal map is executed. This allows us to have access to the most recent value for each sensor stored directly in memory so that we can provide it as part of the feature vector to the model. Lastly, the model is then executed against the most recent data set and a determination is made as to whether the platform requires preventative maintenance or not. Let's take a look inside the initialization method. The first thing we do is retrieve the raw bytes of the PMML file from the state store using the predefined key to, to, lo to locate the bytes. Next, we will use a utility from the PMML library that we've, third party library that we've imported to convert these raw bytes into a PMML format. Then we create a model evaluator and initialize it with the PMML representation of the model as shown here. After we verify that the model definition is correct, we get the feature vector definition and the list of predicted values for the model. We save these values for later so that we can map, map them back to the input values that we need as well as map to the output values. This completes the initialization phase that only needs to be executed once. This is for the model itself. The other part of the initialization process involves retrieving some user spe user specific configuration values that are provided when the model is first deployed. For this function, there are a few configuration variables that we need. First and foremost, since we are going to be listening to multiple topics, we need to have a way of determining which sensor value we have received based on the input topic name that we received it on. For instance, if a value comes in on topic A, we need to know that this that it is a reading from a temperature sensor, for example. We also want to specify which of the model prediction fields we are going to use to make our determination as to whether the machine needs immediate maintenance or not. Now, since our model has multiple output values, we need to make this a value explicit. Last but not least, we need to specify the threshold for this prediction value that indicates a need for immediate action. For example, any predicted value above this amount is an indication of imminent failure. So in our case, if we're looking at mean time to failure and we've configured less than one hour, that would be an example of a threshold setting. Again, this executes once and is saved for the entirety of the Pulsar function execution. Next, these three code blocks handle the recording of the incoming sensor data and execution of the model itself. It is important to know that we will only be getting a value from a single sensor each time this the process method is called and not all of the sensors. However, our model needs values from all of the sensors. Therefore, this code simply stores the latest sensor value in an internal map of values based on the source topic. This is where the user configuration we saw earlier comes into play. For example, if the input topic name is A, as retrieved from the context object that is shown in the second line, then we know we have a temperature sensor reading, so we can update the temperature seating temperature sensor reading in the map. Once we have updated the sensor reading, we invoke the machine learning model to determine if the platform needs maintenance. We construct the feature vector from the internal map of sensor values in the get feature vector method and pass it in to the model itself. And that's the method required maintenance. Now when we get the value of the configured prediction field and compare it to the configured threshold, based on that value relative the predicted value relative to the threshold, we decide whether maintenance is required or not. That's it. This artifact can be easily generated using a traditional build tool such as Maven. So because we're using the NiFi NAR Maven plugin as shown here at the top, 
the output of the maven clean install command will be a NAR, NAR, a, a NAR artifact, which bundles all these third-party libraries required with it along with the class into a single bundled artifact. All that needs to be done to achieve this is to specify the corresponding library as a dependency as shown here. In this case, we're using the JPMML library, as I mentioned earlier, as our execution engine for the machine learning model itself. By specifying it as a dependency and running the build command, the, the NAR plugin will automatically include this dependency jar file with the artifact when it gets deployed, making it available to the code at runtime. Now, once the NAR artifact has been produced, we can simply copy it and the configuration file over to the IoT gateway using its TCP IP connection as a means of getting that information there. This slide shows the command that you can execute to create the Pulsar function by specifying the full path to the NAR file and the configuration file. As you can see here, we give it the, the most recent NAR file, specify the class name of the actual Pulsar function itself. This is the full class name and also a, a configuration file which, which contains several values which we'll look at next. The configuration file looks something like this and specifies various basic values such as the tenant and namespace. It also specifies the input topic here as a regex expression as we mentioned earlier so it is listening to any and all sensor related topics coming in on this particular tenant and namespace specifies an output topic of where alerts will be published to. And this file also includes a user configuration section that contains the topic map, prediction field, and threshold for triggering alert that we discussed earlier. So let's summarize what we've seen thus far. In summary, I have shown a way to utilize Apache Pulsar's unique architecture to create an execution environment for machine learning models on the edge. Pulsar support for the MQTT protocol makes it ideally suited for deployment on IoT gateway devices, which allows us to execute machine learning models much closer to the source of the data, which is the entire goal of edge computing. The pattern I have shown works for all model types and languages and follows the four basic steps of having the data science team load the model to the Pulsar state store once it deems it ready for production, the Pulsar function initializes an execution environment once for the model by leveraging a, th a third party library that can be bundled with the artifact itself. The Pulsar function can then collect all the input data to populate the feature vector, which is then fed to the model to generate a prediction, and we can react to this prediction accordingly. Pulsar functions are an ideal use case framework for this use case because of the following advantages it has. They can be run on the edge, Pulsar functions that is, can be run on the edge to reduce the decision latency. They are automatically triggered when the conditions in the environment change, i.e. a new sensor reading comes in, a change of a value comes in, the entire model is re-executed to evaluate those changing environmental conditions. You can dynamically swap in newer versions of the trained model to adjust to various factors over time. And last but not least, you can leverage a wide variety of third-party libraries in order to support the broadest range of machine learning model types and toolkits available. At this time, I'd like to take any questions. I want to thank all those for attending this talk. I also want to remind you that there's on-demand Pulsar training available at academy.streamnative.io, including interactive uh, tra training sessions on all the different programming languages and APIs, including Java, Python, Go, C Sharp, C++, and Python. And again, make, a, make you aware that we are also hiring at Stream Native. Go to streamnative.io slash careers if you want to come work with me and a company that's developing Apache Pulsar. And last but not least, let's keep in touch. This is my Twitter handle. Please follow me. This is my LinkedIn contact. Please feel, feel, feel free to reach out and connect. And there's my, Gitter, my GitHub repo, where there's lots of code examples available for you to play with, including this one. Thank you so much, and have a great day.